From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. Recent events have reminded us that we cannot always trust the police to protect us. In the U.S., though, bad policemen and women represent only a small minority of law enforcement. I feel I can turn to the police if I need help, and if I report a crime, I believe they will respond and investigate my claim. The police in Nome, Alaska, however, often did not take reports of sexual harassment seriously especially claims made by Alaska Native women. The Nome Police Department had a serious problem, and it took the murder of a beautiful 19-year-old woman to expose the ugly truth. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting to you from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. Sonia Ivanov grew up in Unalakleet, Alaska, a small village with approximately 700 residents. Unalakleet is located on Norton Sound in the Bering Sea at the mouth of the Unalakleet River. It sits 148 miles southeast of Nome and 395 miles northwest of Anchorage. The majority of the residents are native Alaskans, primarily Inuit. Sonia shined brightly in her small village. She was a star on the girls' high school basketball team, and she was also an honor roll student with a friendly, outgoing personality. After graduating from high school, Sonia and her best friend moved to Nome and shared an apartment. Nome is a community of approximately 3,800 people, and it offers more employment opportunities than Unalakleet. Sonia worked in the hospital admissions department at the Norton Sound Health Corporation. On August 10, 2003, Sonia and her roommate visited friends. A little after midnight, the two roommates went their separate ways. Lam Go, a janitor at the Tesoro station in Nome, saw Sonia walk past the station sometime between 1 and 1.15 a.m., a few minutes later, Sonia walked past Florence Habros and Denit Malewotkuk, standing on the porch of their mother's house. Denit was a sophomore and an athlete at Nome High School. She recognized Sonia because she'd recently watched Sonia play in a city basketball game and had admired Sonia's skill on the court. Denise and Florence exchanged greetings with Sonia and then watched Sonia walk down the street. They saw a marked gnome police vehicle slowly follow Sonia and then pull in front of her on West D Street. The driver rolled down the passenger side window and Sonia leaned in the window to talk to the driver. She then opened the door and climbed into the vehicle. Sonia's roommate returned home in the early morning hours of August 11th and was surprised not to find Sonia at home. She called several friends, but no one remembered seeing Sonia since the previous evening. On the morning of August 12th, Sonia's roommate called the police, not to report Sonia missing, but to find out if Sonia had been arrested and was in jail. Finally, on August 12th, at 5.16 p.m., the roommate went to the Nome Police Department to report her friend missing. She told the police that she had not seen Sonia Ivanov for 41 hours. The roommate described what Sonia was wearing the last time she saw her. Sonia's clothing included blue jeans and a pair of Skechers shoes. Sonia usually carried her identification, including her Recreation Center ID. She wore her apartment keys on a chain around her neck and a metal band attached a wallet to her arm. 
The search for Sonia Ivanov began at 8.30 p.m. on August 12th. On August 13th, retired attorney John Larson and his wife, two of the many people who volunteered to search for Sonia, discovered her body in a clump of bushes near an abandoned gold mine. She had been killed near the side of Dredge Road 5, a little used road about three to five miles outside of Nome. Sonia was naked except for a sock on her left foot, and she had bruises on her face, neck, and chest, and blood on her face. On August 15, 2003, Chief Medical Examiner Frank Valico performed the autopsy on Sonia Ivanov. Valico determined that Sonia died from a 22 caliber bullet wound to the back of her head, and the killer had fired the bullet from a very close range. Valico found no evidence of a sexual assault. The medical examiner and crime scene analyst discovered no trace physical evidence, such as skin scrapings under Sonia's fingernails, foreign hairs, fingerprints, semen, or other DNA evidence on her body. The lack of trace evidence on or near Sonia's corpse alerted law enforcement personnel to the possibility that Sonia's killer had evidence awareness. In other words, the murderer knew how and where the police would search for forensic clues, and he made sure not to leave any incriminating evidence. Why would anyone kill Sonia Ivanov? The lovely young athlete had many friends, a good job, and a bright future. Florence Habros said she saw Sonia get into a police car. If a policeman had killed Sonia, he would likely have been careful not to leave incriminating evidence. Were the officers from the Nome Police Department looking for one of their own? Only two officers, Stan Pascoia and Matthew Owens, were on duty during the early morning hours of August 11, 2003, when Sonia disappeared. The Nome Police Department used three Ford Expeditions as patrol vehicles. They had two older Expeditions, Vehicles 321 and 322, and a newer model, Vehicle 983. Vehicle 983 sported running boards on its sides and had a 911 sticker on the back. On the early morning when Sonia disappeared, Officer Pascoia was driving the newer Expedition, 983, while Owens drove one of the older vehicles, 322. When police first asked Florence Habros to describe the police vehicle that had picked up Sonia Ivanov, Habros said, it was the new car, and she said it had a 911 sticker on the back. Later, she said the vehicle Sonia entered did not have running boards, indicating the expedition in question was one of the older vehicles. Officer Pascoia said he and Owens were tied up with a midnight domestic violence call for about an hour. When they returned to the police station, Pascoia wrote the domestic violence report, and Owens left the station. Pascoia said he did not see Owens during the 2 a.m. bar closing patrols, but Owens drove him home an hour later at the end of their shifts. When searchers found Sonia's body, Nome Police Chief Ralph Taylor immediately requested the assistance of the Alaska State Troopers. A few days later, Taylor handed the entire case to the troopers. At the time, this move seemed curious, because a police agency doesn't usually invite another law enforcement entity to investigate a crime in its jurisdiction. Before long, though, the reason for Chief Taylor's decision to ask the troopers to investigate the case became apparent, and his move to withdraw the known police from the investigation proved wise. Six weeks after the murder of Sonia Ivanov, someone stole one of the SUVs from the Nome Police Department's lot. Ninety minutes later, Officer Matthew Owens found the vehicle in the gravel pit. 
Owens claimed someone fired shots at him with the vehicle shotgun. The Nome police and the Alaska State Troopers searched the area but did not find a suspect. The Nome police generally lock their vehicles after parking them in the police lot, but they left a key in the ignition and a key in the gun case. If someone managed to break into a vehicle, he would have easy access to the gun in the SUV. The police towed the expedition back to the station and examined the vehicle, searching for any evidence that might lead them to the thief. The culprit had smashed in one of the windows in the SUV, but the crime scene techs found no incriminating fingerprints in the vehicle. They did find Sonia's Recreation Center ID, a card she almost certainly had with her the night she disappeared, and an envelope containing a typed note. It read, Pigs, I hate cops. I hate every one of you. Sonia was just a person in the wrong place at the wrong time. I do not know her. As you can see, it was easy for me to take your pig car keys right there. It was not her fault. She thought I was a pig, and shit just happened. She was just a person, and I wanted to see if I could that night. Every one of you should be more careful. I watch every move you make. You leave me alone, and I will leave you alone. I will also shoot you in the head if you get close. After the theft of the vehicle and the discovery of the note, Alaska State Trooper Investigation Sergeant Randy McFerron focused the investigation on 29-year-old Matthew Owens. The troopers believed Owens had staged the stolen vehicle and threatening note to divert suspicion for the murder of Sonia Ivanov away from himself. On October 25, 2003, troopers arrested Matthew Owens at his residence and charged him with the murder of Sonia Ivanov. They took him into custody sooner than they had planned because they feared he was about to leave town. Owens went to the bank twice on October 24th, and they heard that one of his relatives had called the airlines twice asking for flight information. They thought Owens was a flight risk, so they arrested him before he could disappear. The grand jury indicted Owens for first-degree murder, tampering with evidence, and official misconduct. The charge of tampering with evidence related to the police vehicle theft. Nearly 20 witnesses testified before the grand jury, including the Nome police chief and five police officers. Florence Habros testified about seeing Sonia get into a police car on the night she vanished. Perhaps the most interesting witness, though, was Matthew Owens' estranged wife, Trin. According to the documents filed when the troopers arrested Owens, he called his wife at work 45 minutes before Sonia Ivanov was reported missing and asked her if she could take their son. He said he needed to go into work because a girl was missing, and it didn't look good. He told Trin the name of the missing girl and offered her a physical description. Then he told Trin to keep the information quiet. Owen's defense attorney, James McComas, filed a motion for a change of venue for the trial, asking Judge Esch to move it either to Fairbanks or Anchorage. McComas said he believed the publicity and gossip surrounding the murder of Sonia Ivanov had tainted the jury pool in Nome. Judge Esch refused to move the trial. Nearly a year and a half after the murder of Sonia Ivanov, the murder case against her accused killer, Matthew Owens, finally went to trial. The trial began on Tuesday, January 18, 2005. Prosecutor Richard Sabotny and his team had no forensic evidence to support their case. So, Sabotny sought to turn this lack of trace evidence, fingerprints, and DNA to his advantage. He attempted to plant the idea into the jurors' minds that the killer had evidence awareness. 
He knew what types of things the police would search for, and he knew how not to leave this evidence. A police officer would have evidence awareness. So the lack of fibers, fingerprints, and DNA pointed toward a policeman. When taken with all the other circumstantial testimony, Sabotny maintained that Matthew Owens was the only viable suspect in the murder of Sonia Ivanov. Owens was on duty when Sonia disappeared. Florence Habros and her sister saw Sonia climb into a police vehicle. Officer Piscoya testified that he did not know where Owens was for more than two hours during their shifts on the night in question. Owens' estranged wife said Owens told her a girl was missing even before Sonia's roommate reached out to police to report her missing friend. No one thing pointed at Matthew Owens, but Sabotny hoped the jurors would consider the totality of the evidence and find Matthew Owens guilty of the murder of Sonia Ivanov. The bullet that killed Sonia had a rare rifling pattern of lands and grooves, and troopers found a 22 caliber pistol with a similar rifling pattern in the police station evidence room, in an area Owens could have accessed. On the stand, though, a firearms expert could not definitively match the bullet to the 22 pistol. The state also presented evidence proving Owens drove to Coffee Creek, 75 miles from Nome, not long after Sonia's murder, and a witness saw him burning items in a pit. When the troopers searched the area, they found grommets from a pair of tilt jeans, eyelets from Skechers shoes, the underwire and other metal parts from a bra, four keys on a ring, and zippers. Sonia was last seen wearing Skechers shoes and jeans, and her roommate said Sonia owned a pair of tilt jeans. One of the keys the troopers found in the pit was similar to a key for Sonia's apartment. A replica of the key fit the lock to Sonia's apartment door, but did not open it. The troopers believed the key found in the fire pit was the key to Sonia's apartment, but the heat of the fire had warped it, so it would no longer open the door. Defense attorney James McComas told the jury that Matthew Owens did not know Sonia Ivanov and had no reason to murder her. He pointed out the lack of hard physical evidence presented by the prosecution and suggested the actual killer was Sonia's ex-boyfriend. Matthew Owens took the stand in his defense and clearly stated that he did not kill Sonia Ivanov. The jury deliberated five days, but could not reach a verdict, and on February 28, 2005, Judge Esch declared a mistrial. When interviewed, the jury foreman said the majority of the jurors voted in favor of conviction. However, the circumstantial nature of the case made it difficult for some jurors to find Owens guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. James McComas again requested a change of venue for the second trial of his client, Matthew Owens. McComas wanted the trial moved to Anchorage or Fairbanks, but Esch instead moved it to Kotzebue, a town of 3,200 people located 184 miles northeast of Nome. Judge Esch said a jury from Kotzebue would be drawn from a community similar to Nome where the crime had occurred. The second trial began on October 17, 2005. The prosecution presented much the same case as it had in the first trial. In his closing argument, McComas told the jury that the state offered nothing more than could have, would have, and might have. McComas said the state didn't even come close to prove without reasonable doubt that Matt Owens is guilty. The jury did not agree with McComas. After deliberating three days, the jury found Matthew Owens guilty of the first-degree murder of Sonia Ivanov. Jurors also found Owens guilty of evidence tampering. Judge Ash sentenced Owens to 99 years in prison. Owens' attempt to appeal his conviction failed.
In late 2005, Sonia Ivanov's family settled a wrongful death suit against the city of Nome. The complaint filed by the Ivanov family said the city should have known Owens would be a danger to the women living in Nome. In 1997, then-police chief Milton Haken refused to hire Owens, citing Owens' lack of character. Despite knowing about Haken's assessment of Owens, though, a new police chief hired Owens in 2000. The murder of Sonia Ivanov by a known policeman finally forced officials to listen to the cries of Alaska Native women in Nome who claimed the police repeatedly ignored their reports of sexual assault. Nome hired a retired police chief from Virginia, and he brought in two cold case detectives to sift through a decade's worth of sexual assault reports. What they found shocked them. Time after time, the report showed that rapes and other sexual crimes often went uninvestigated in Nome. Sometimes the police never even bothered to interview the victim or suspect. Police Chief Robert Estes announced that he and his staff plan to review 460 sexual assault cases going back almost a decade and a half. The Nome City Council seemed less than enthusiastic about this idea, though. They did not want to dredge up old cases. They only wanted to look forward. Finally, Robert Estes felt defeated. He did not believe he could accomplish the job he was hired to do, so he resigned and returned to Virginia. Robert Estes might think he accomplished nothing in Nome, but he shined a bright light on the ugly problem of sexual abuse against Alaska Native women. The new Nome City manager promises to hire additional detectives and continue the cold case review started by Estes and his group. We will never know why Sonia Ivanov climbed into Matthew Owens' police cruiser. Did he offer her a ride home? Did she know him? Sonia was not drunk or impaired in any way when she accepted a ride from Owens. Whatever reason Sonia had for getting into his car, I'm sure she felt safe. We might not always like the police, but most of the time we trust them. Sonia Ivanov paid with her life because she trusted the police. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. You can also search for this podcast on Patreon to learn more about the Last Frontier Club. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the last frontier.